So a uh, very good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the security stream at the GSE conference. Um, I know most of you know me. Morning, Andrew, by the way. Hi, Angie. Hi, Beth. A few familiar faces there. Um, my name's Jamie Pease. I'm the chair of the security stream. And uh, you're very welcome to this session. Um, so this is session 1BA. And um, for the purpose of feedback, this session, by the way, is has been pre-recorded. Uh, so we'll be listening to a, a recording in a moment. I'll play that back. Um, so please do leave your feedback. You'll see the QR code in, in a moment on, um, on the presenter's slide. So we've got Malcolm Trigg and Phil Richards from Microfocus uh, who, um, have, uh, who have done their presentation for us. Um, so this session is being recorded, even though we are listening to recording, it is being recorded uh, still through Zoom. Um, and by the way, if you are listening to the recording at some point in the future, you can still leave feedback. That's an important point to, to note. Um, so please do that. We'll, the, the feedback will be open for, uh, for, for a while now to enable you to do that. Um, just a quick announcement, by the way, our next GSE security working group meeting for 2021 will be on the 4th of February. Um, and that will be via Zoom also. We're not in a position at the moment where we can go back to uh, physical meetings, of course. So the date is up on the GSE UK region website. Um, so at least you can save the date in your calendar. Um, and over the next few weeks, uh, into probably early December, we'll open up registration. But a big ask uh, for, for the listeners, uh, we are looking for presenters. So we've got a couple of uh, presenters already have come forward, um, but we've got something like seven slots to fill. Um, so if you are interested in um, presenting them, please do send me an email. Um, it's jamie.pease at gse.org.uk. Um, and we're particularly interested, I mean, we love hearing from vendors, of course, you know, getting all those really good updates and insights, but we're also very keen to have users come forward. What we mean by users is like the real users, like customers, you know, they're working in banks, retail, you know, insurance companies and so on. We love hearing, you know, uh, you know, real stories about, you know, challenges that you've, you've had to meet, um, how you conquered them, etc. cetera. Um, so, if you've got an interesting topic, then um, please do come forward. We'd love to hear from you. But uh, without further ado, I'm now going to uh, uh, play Malcolm and Phil's uh, presentation. So I hope you enjoy it. Um, please do post questions in the chat, by the way, and don't be afraid to ask questions. Like I said yesterday, the chances are, you know, somebody, you know, you'll, you'll might be afraid to put in a question in a, like an electronic forum, but the chances are probably somebody else wants to ask that question as well. And, uh, and, and like I say, we all kind of learn from each other. It's, we might, you know, for that response to that question, we might pick up something new. So uh, please do that. And then we'll, we'll go through the questions at the end. So I'm just going to switch over now, share my screen and, uh, and get the recording underway. Um, and I uh, hope you enjoy it. Hello, and welcome to the Microfocus presentation entitled Mainframe Security Best Practice. My name is Malcolm Trigg, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Phil Richards. We are both principal systems engineers for Microfocus, and between us, we have 53 years of service, which explains the gray hair. Though I do have to say in our industry, that's not actually that uncommon. Today we're going to discuss some best practices around securing access to mainframe systems and how we can apply modern day security standards and practices to mainframe systems. Now I must stress to you that we cannot take credit for all the content of this presentation as many of the ideas have come from those 53 years of working with organisations like yours in order to provide solutions for securing access to mainframes. So if you like, this is our findings from experience working with organisations like yours. We're going to look at how securing mainframe access used to be provided and then explain how that is changing. 
we're also going to discuss what security means to today's organisations. Now before we begin, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you have any questions then please post them to the chat window and we will answer them after the presentation has concluded. Let us start off with looking at what we mean by security and just how far can you practically take security. As we know, everything we do on a day-to-day -day basis has risks such as crossing the road. Now, as an individual, we accept these risks and we mitigate the risk where possible by some form of control. For example, if we know it's going to rain, then we don't want to run the risk of getting wet. So we take an umbrella to mitigate the risk and reduce the risk of getting wet to a level we can accept. Security is very much the same. So let us now take a look at an example. So here we have a typical desktop computer system. It's plugged into the corporate network via an ethernet cable. It has a base unit, a keyboard, a mouse, and of course, a screen. So let me show you in a few simple, easy to follow steps, how we can make this totally secure. Now, as we know, a lot of problems are caused by human operators making mistakes. I mean, without human operators, IT's job would be so much easier. There'd be no miskeying of information or entering of information to the wrong fields on the systems, which IT so lovingly provided for our users to use. So, firstly, we move the keyboard and mouse as we want to mitigate the risk of any user errors and stop any malicious users from causing our corporate information damage. Yeah, but users also can't be trusted to access our corporate network. I mean, there are all sorts of malicious people out there. Hackers, for example, who want to attack the desktop. So let us stop that by removing the Ethernet connection to the network. Problem solved. Here we also find that when we display information, people have been known to misuse it or sell the information, such as credit card numbers, to people who want to make money out of it. So let's mitigate that risk. We simply remove the screen from the system. Yeah, but the base unit still has uh, peripherals that can be plugged into it, such as a keyboard and mouse, etc. Yeah, so we need to secure the base unit. So let's secure that from happening by very simply putting the desktop workstation behind a brick wall, totally sealed in. And there you are, totally secure. So I hope you found that totally informative and we'll now go back to your organisations with your five point action plan for making your information systems totally secure. So the most secure system is one that no one can interact with. But of course, systems are designed to run organisations and a key aspect to any organisation are its people, the employees. And the employees of the organisation need to access the information in order to carry out their roles. So a balance has to be found between the need to secure the information systems and the need to access these systems. Now the IBM mainframe has a long history and still provides core business functionality today. The need to protect this valuable asset has long been known. So let's take a moment to look back in time to how the mainframe was protected decades ago and contrast that with the modern security paradigm. Probably the biggest change that has taken place over the decades is the view of organisations to the inside of threat. For many years, the view was always outside was bad and inside was good. So it should be no surprise that very few systems were exposed to external access. And if they were, they were generally set up to use dedicated least telecommunication lines. There would have been horror if they thought that their information was traveling across a publicly accessible network, as many do today. Today, of course, we know that the insider threat is just as great as the external threat, and arguably even greater, as users have legitimate access to valuable information. Now, there was a view decades ago that having a computer system which very few people understood how to use gave a level of security. Now, it is true that it's nothing like the computer system that people use at home, such as Windows, Linux, or Google Android. And if a user were to access an IBM mainframe outside of the application, they generally wouldn't have a clue as to what to do. And a corporate developer, for example, a website developer, if he gained access to the console access on the mainframe again, he wouldn't have much of a clue what to actually do. But don't rely on this because a corporate hacker probably will. But we still see this attitude today. For example, where a part number is changed from a common well-known part number to some obscure part number in the hope that this will fool an attacker. Of course, this may slow them down, but not stop them. 
This view or attitude is often termed as security through obscurity. Now I would say it is true that this is less so today, but I wouldn't say this attitude has totally gone away. It is true of course that the mainframe is less well understood by most people. However, it must be remembered that if your car application is running on the IBM mainframe, then this would be the ultimate goal of a hacker wanting to steal valuable information or to steal financial information. So never rely upon security through obscurity and never use it as a policy. Physical security has been around for decades, of course, and though the technology has changed, the objectives haven't. A common sight are security guards which provide a detective and de preventative control and makes physically accessing the mainframe a lot less likely. The use of man traps whereby only one person can access at a time, stopping somebody tailgating whereby somebody with legitimate access opens a door and is followed by somebody else who doesn't have access to that environment. Moving these valuable assets to data centres where security could be applied to them all. Closed circuit television of course has been around for decades and helps to act as a deterrent to anyone wanting to gain unlawful access to the data centre. Of course all these are still as relevant today but they only help to stop physical attacks on the data centre. Let's look at some administrative controls which are still in use today. Ensuring anybody visiting the data centre signs in and out as well as providing proof of ID and by appointment only with a nominated chaperone i.e. you'll never be left on your own to run the building or systems. The vetting of staff such as criminal records checks. And as I said, these are still in use today and as relevant today as well. Let's look at a couple of technical controls that were in place many years ago. Now, it was many years ago and I have to admit, I started my career some 40 years ago programming with access via a dumb terminal, not unlike the one shown here. Now, anyone who has ever accessed a mainframe will know that in order to do so, you need a user ID and a password. And the user ID is not shared with other users, but it's for the sole dedicated use by a single user. Now, because the dumb terminal was a physical device, which was directly connected to a front-end processor, the location within the building could have a significance to the permissions granted by the user. For example, console access may only be granted to terminals with certain logical units. LUs. The use of LUs as part of the permissions is still common today. However, dumb terminals have been replaced by a software component called Terminal Emulation, which runs on the user's Windows desktop, and the connection to the mainframe is via Ethernet using Telnet. We've looked at examples of how the mainframe was protected for decades, and most of the security was around physical security, stopping an attacker from physically accessing the data center in order to protect the IBM mainframe. Now the world of course has moved on at a fast pace and the need for ever more information to be made available on mobile devices across insecure networks. Now this has to play security at the heart of everything that organisation does. The information that drives the business has to be kept secure. And today's organisations talk about information security. The Oxford Languages definition shown here defines information security as the state of being protected against the unauthorised use of information especially electronic data, or the measures taken to achieve this. Now in reality, security goes far beyond stopping unauthorised access, as we shall see in the remainder of this presentation. Information security within organisations has three goals, and anyone who has worked in security will be familiar with the three goals of information security, often referred to as a CIA triad. It covers the three goals of information security, confidentiality, integrity and availability. These core goals underpin the enterprise's information security. So let us look at what each of these goals cover. Let us start by looking at the first goal, that of confidentiality. The first thing that most people think of when asked what they think confidentiality means is that it is about keeping information private, keeping it secret and ensuring that only those who need to access the information can do so and importantly preventing unauthorised access from people both inside and outside the organisation. But today it's not just people who need to be controlled, but also devices, as people have access to more and more devices and are demanding the same information to be made available. So someone accessing information while sat at their physical desktop 
may want to access the same information whilst on the move via the smartphone or tablet device. This puts a challenge on keeping information confidential whilst at the same time opening up access to it. As well as keeping information private or secret, most people when asked about confidentiality also mention encryption. Encrypting traffic across a network, whether that's a network which is public or private. So it's taking clear text information and converting it into an encrypted format so that it can't be easily accessible by those who want to make use of it. So it is true that it's very difficult to stop people from monitoring communication lines, especially if the connection is made from a public network such as a coffee shop. However, encryption ensures that even though they can get the information, they can't make sense of it. For many years, organisations concentrate on keeping information secret by protecting access to information. Many neglecting the need to encrypt traffic to or from the mainframe systems. And the big game changer really was regulations that mandated strong encryption of, of traffic. This led to a big rise in the number of organisations who secured their mainframe connections. The regulations also had real consequences to the organisation should they not comply. For example, the PCI DSS regulations that cover all organisations that handle credit card data mandated that credit card information must be transported across networks using secure protocols. And a failure to comply could result in the organisation's ability to process credit card transactions being revoked. With GDPR came real teeth, whereby the fines are substantial as well as the adverse publicity caused. Part of confidentiality is ensuring that the data is given the correct classification so that it can be protected accordingly. Not tagging information with the correct security level can lead to access being granted to those who should not have access to it. And also giving information the incorrect classification could mean spending a lot of money protecting information which has a very low classification level or should have a low classification level. So some areas where things can go wrong are shoulder surfing, which is a threat to the business whereby somebody walking past somebody else's desk reads information from the screen and then later reuses that information or shares it with a third party. Somebody could steal credit card numbers simply by walking past somebody's desk and looking at the screen and making a note of the credit card information, hence the term shoulder surfing. Now this is a particularly nasty attack as the, as the legitimate person viewing the credit card would be audited as having accessed the account and would therefore be under suspicion of being the person who disclosed it to a third party. Now either failing to encrypt information or to be using out-of-date standards can lead to disclosure of information on a wide scale. Now many patches today have security updates, so being out-of-date with patches can lead to threats that are well known and may be published for the world to see. Organisations are driven by information, so it is very important that an organisation can trust the integrity of the information. The Integrity CIA Triad Goal is all about protecting information from unauthorised changes, ensuring that the enterprise can have confidence in the integrity of the information. An attacker may wish to modify information for financial gain or for malicious intent. Use of strong authentication and authorization, along with encryption and hashing algorithms, can protect against malicious changes. Though ensuring integrity doesn't stop someone from making unauthorised changes, it does ensure that the unauthorised change would be detected. It is also important that the integrity of information is protected both in transit across a network or whilst at rest on a device. A common misunderstanding is that encryption provides integrity. Traffic that is encrypted can be altered, although the person committing the unauthorised change would have no idea what the change will do. This would be a malicious attack. Using encryption with hashing algorithms provides the best defence. Where no repudiation is required, then digital certificates should be used. This allows data to be signed with a digital certificate proving who sent the data. Of course, as always, strong authentication and authorization can stop people having access to information they really shouldn't have access to. The unintentional changes causing integrity issues are no less serious. Automation such as macros or RPA, such as robotic process automation solutions, have to be closely monitored and tested, otherwise they could be responsible for making incorrect changes on an industrial scale. 
ensuring all those who have access to information are well trained and understand what they should be doing and for mainframe systems how they should engage with the screens. Enterprise should also ensure that their personnel operate with least privilege and that their authorization is in line with their role. And application developers play a part as well, ensuring that data is validated accordingly before writing away to the database. It is crucial for an enterprise to have systems that are available when authorised users need access to them. Some obvious areas are ensuring that there is redundancy built into the systems and where possible there are no single points of failure. Sometimes users can unintentionally cause a system to be unavailable, for example if they have access to systems at an inappropriate level, such as access to the Linux shell, or if they are not trained in the correct way of doing things. Of course, anything that brings down or makes a system unavailable is a form of denial of service, but we tend to associate denial of service attacks with those with malicious intent. Application patches or patches for the OS should be tested to ensure that the application software, for example, will continue to operate normally after the patch has been rolled out. Otherwise, the application availability can be adversely affected. So far, we've discussed the history of protecting the mainframe assets and also how organisations today, more than at any other time, are taking security very seriously and have information security policies backed by executives. So I hope this has given you an understanding of what is going through the mind of the organisation's Chief Information Security Officer. So let's now turn to the mainframe and discuss where does the mainframe system sit when it comes to information security goals and how can we better protect it. The mainframe, as we've discussed, is running business critical applications and is used to operate the business, so it needs to be afforded the very best security. However, we have seen on so many occasions the business asking for a delay in implementing a security control and the business accepting the risk of not putting a control in place in order to mitigate a risk. And sadly, the press is littered with headlines of organisations where information protected by a low level of security has been breached. In the next section, we will look specifically at the best practice of securing access and protecting information that's held on these valuable mainframe assets. OK, thanks, Malcolm, and uh, hello from me. Um, as Malcolm said, I'm going to just take a few slides to look at some of the options for protecting your connection to the mainframe. So let's start by comparing how we have tended to connect to host systems in the past versus how we might, for example, connect to other services, other enterprise services these days. So just before we do that, for clarity, by host systems, I mean connecting to all hosts, normally by using a terminal emulator. Now, the bulk of the host connections that we as this audience are, are doing are probably to mainframes or um, i-series machines. But the same applies for Unisys, for Tandem, for all sorts of VT um, applications, connections. The connections themselves could be coming from software running on a client desktop or a server. The most likely is um, that it's coming from client software, probably a thick client running on a desktop. It may involve Citrix or some sort of terminal services, but in effect, it's a client connection. So this first slide isn't showing any host connectivity. This shows how typically we would connect to a farm of database servers today. On the left, we show that there's not really any circumstances where we would expect to connect to a, a piece of client software directly to a database server. Certainly, there's, I can't think of any reason why you would have um, a, an admin connecting directly through to a database server for administrative purposes. On the right, we show what's more likely to happen. We can see the database servers on the right of the diagram. On the left, we can see the users and the DB admin. On the left is a business network, and on the right is a secure network. Typically, users will access the database indirectly via an application server. That application server is calling the database over the secure network. The users, the DB admin, do not have direct access to the database themselves. The application server is their access to the database, and it's further protecting the database by extra user authentication using the directory services. Likewise, 
database administrators don't have direct access to the databases. They they access the database typically via an intermediary, like a jump server. This jump server can carry out additional security, authentication, authorization to determine the level of access the DB admin can have. Now compare that with how we see many mainframes and other host systems being accessed. Now, I'm not saying that everyone does this this way still. There's lots of organizations who have moved to a more secure approach, but there are and still remains plenty out there who still do it this way. It's still the case that users with connectivity software have direct access to the host systems, to the mainframe systems. The configuration will link directly to the mainframe and hosts. The IP address and port number will be that of the mainframe. Once you know the IP address and the port number, you're close to being able to get the connection directly to the mainframe. All you need is an emulator, and there's some very basic emulators available to download from the internet. Of course, you still need a user ID and password to get logged on, but often user IDs are easy enough to work out, which means that you're then just a password away from an active logged on connection. And in some cases, that password is still an eight character password. You can still do damage without an emulator and without user IDs and passwords. If, if you know the host details, then you can launch a denial of service attack without the need for emulation. Of course, this is why mainframes are normally routinely protected from the outside world and require extra security when offering services to partners and external bureaus and the like. But access to the host systems are typically required by many, many employees in the enterprise. If they're working in the office, then there are potential issues, but they're connecting from the in-house network. Initiatives such as working from home has made host connectivity so much more risky. This diagram shows one of our preferred options, that the host systems are inside the secure network on the right-hand side. They are accessed and protected by a proxy running inside the firewall. The business network on which the users are running does not, it doesn't directly connect to the mainframe, but only via the proxy. They still have a terminal emulator, but the configuration on there is that of connecting to the proxy. The proxy is able to determine the validity of the connection request and forward any data onto the host system, in our case, the mainframe. Of course, the proxy can introduce extra safeguards to ensure the validity of the connection. It can integrate with the corporate directory services to insist on authentication before granting access. And this authentication may take the form of multi-factor authentication. This multi-factor authentication can itself be the starting point for enhanced host authentication incorporating single sign-on. And I think Malcolm will talk a little bit more about that soon. We're also aware of solutions where the proxy is integrated tightly with the terminal emulator and only allows traffic through the proxy from that particular terminal emulator, probably using specific connection settings. This incorporating central management of the connection settings prevents users from building their own solutions using less secure software. So let's summarize on that. The proxy controls access to the mainframe or any host system running within the secure network. So the access to the proxy server can be based on Active Directory rules and therefore role-based access controls. A terminal emulator is still needed, but there's proxies um, that work with specific emulation types. Mainframe credentials are required, but these can be complemented with additional authentication and can be a starting point for secure single sign-on solutions. One other thing to mention here is that the type of service being provided can be limited by the proxy. So for example, we might be able to configure the proxy so that it only allows terminal emulation traffic to go through whilst restricting um, file transfer FTP traffic. Here's another, here's another option. Um, 
This diagram shows a subtle difference from the previous diagram. There's no longer a terminal emulator installed at the desktop. Instead, we're using a supported browser. In this diagram, the proxy has been taken, the proxy has taken the form of a terminal session server. All the host communications, all the host sessions even, are running within the firewall. They all connect to the host systems using the secure network. The business network carries HTTPS secure socket traffic between the terminal session servers running inside the uh, firewall and the browser, which is displaying the terminal representation uh, using HTML. So in this case, the client or user is simply connecting to a web server. That web server initiates a connection to the host system, which in this car case is the mainframe, and that's over the secure network. The user still receives a sign-on screen and uses their credentials to log into the mainframe. But the user has no idea where the mainframe is or, or, or how to get there or how it's addressed. So as with the previous solution, the web server and the session server can be protected via the enterprise directory services, which could include multi-factor authentication and again could be the starting point for a single sign-on solution. The web server and session server together are acting as the proxy, but they're also acting, uh, running, they're, they're actually running the mainframe sessions within the firewall. So again, a bit of a summary before we finish, or everything's authenticated here using the AD security groups. Access is from the server to the host, so there's no access from anywhere else. Just to emphasize that, there's, there's no direct access to the hosts from the user device, only to the web server. And I say device because this could be any device that supports a supported web browser. This is what we call HTML on the fly emulation. And in a way, you could think of it as the, um, the web server um, providing a front end to the host application. And that front end takes the form of a HTML supplied um, emulation. Okay, with that, I'll hand back to uh, Malcolm to continue. Thanks, Malcolm. Uh, thank you, Phil. And let's look at strong authentication. When we looked at the security information triad, we mentioned strong authentication against all three goals. Those goals being the confidentiality, integrity and availability. So what is wrong with the way the mainframe out of the box authenticates users? The mainframe logon screen is typically something like this. It asks the user to provide their given user ID and password in order to log on to the host and access the applications. The password is eight characters in length and the credentials are not linked to the corporate identity management system such as Active Directory. And by modern standards, this is now considered insecure. So what would be considered secure today? The mainframe logon screen with its eight character password field has been in use for many decades and has long been seen as insecure. Many organizations still rely upon the eight character password though today. But today organizations are moving are moving towards using more than one factor. So what is a factor? A user ID and password is one factor authentication, but there are two other factors. Let's look at all three factors. The first one is something you know, such as the user ID and password, or perhaps a passphrase in its place. So rather than using an eight character password, you would type in a much longer phrase. And being a phrase, it is more likely to be remembered. A personal identification number, PIN number, such as the PIN number you use with your credit card or debit card. So there's something you know is something you have to remember. The second is something you have. This is something that you have been given in order to authenticate you are who you say you are. Some examples are the credit or debit card your bank sent you. A token device which will display a one-time password or OTP. This is a one-time password that has to be used within so many seconds, say for example 30 seconds, of being presented on the device. These days the OTP device may well be your smartphone. An employee badge is also something you have. So this is something that you have been given which is specifically ties you to you, i.e. the credit card is for an account you own. The third and final one is something you are. 
for example, your fingerprint, retina scan or voice recognition. Therefore, it is something that you physically are. Each of these is called a factor and there are three to have to select from. Something you know, something you have and something you are. By selecting more than one factor, we have multi-factor authentication. The user ID and password doesn't have to be a factor. For example, when you buy something on your credit card, you present your card, which is something you have, and enter your PIN number, which is something you know. Now, there have been many breaches of mainframe data where having multi-factor authentication would have stopped it. And one big benefit is it reduces the chance of social engineering attacks or brute force password attacks from working, as a password is not the only form of defence. Here are some examples of something you have, such as token devices, and something you are, such as fingerprint. One other form of authentication is based on your location. This means that when you're in the office, you can connect to the mainframe. But as soon as you leave the office, and perhaps work from a coffee shop, your ability to log onto the mainframe could be revoked. Using this type of authentication makes sense for mobile type devices, such as smartphones, our laptops. So how do we implement multi-factor authentication for mainframe access? In order to gain green screen access to a mainframe, a terminal emulator is required. And there are basically two ways of providing multi-factor authentication, on the mainframe or off the mainframe. This illustration shows a terminal emulator first connecting to a server which provides the multi-factor authentication, perhaps tied into the corporate Active Directory. And only when the user has proved who they are will the server allow the terminal emulator to connect to the mainframe. Now this we've seen being used for all mainframe users, or sometimes just for controlling privileged access to the mainframe by the administrators. Now once the mainframe screen is presented to the user, they then enter their normal user ID and password. In this example, the terminal emulator connects the mainframe directly and the mainframe forces the use of the multi-factor authentication. In this example here, it makes the user enter their Active Directory password and a token which is displayed on their mobile phone. This links the mainframe login to the corporate Active Directory and this gets away from the 8-character password. And if the AD user is disabled, then they no longer have access to the mainframe. And password changes also only need to happen on Active Directory, so the user never needs to change their password or remember their password to gain access to the mainframe. One other form of authentication is authenticating to the mainframe through the use of the IBM DCAS facility, the Digital Certificate Authentication Service. The diagram shows that as long as the user has been authenticated by the Trusted Authentication Service, then a one-time password or token is presented back to the terminal emulator. This must then be entered into the password field of the mainframe in a timely manner. By using this method, the user never needs to know their username or password in order to gain access to the mainframe. The mainframe access is controlled by access to security groups in Active Directory. This means a role-based access methodology can be applied to mainframe users. The user never needs to forget their mainframe U credentials ever again. Typically with mainframes, the user logs on at the start of the session and remains logged on for the duration. However, there are screens that contain sensitive information. Perhaps a re-authentication would be useful to ensure they are definitely still the person logged onto the machine and haven't just walked away from the desktop without locking the Windows desktop. Also, there may be times when the supervisor may have to provide their credentials in order to allow a user to gain access to a particular part of the application, which is better than simply increasing the user's privileges. Thank you, Malcolm, and, uh, and so to data privacy. So if you were to start a conversation on secure access to the mainframe to someone, and uh, you'll probably more likely as not start to talk about passwords and data encryption. Now, I think we've already always had passwords, but most of us are probably old enough to remember having to implement data encryption for the first time. 
So it doesn't seem that long ago that uh, we moved from clear text to SSL and then on to TLS 1.1 and probably what we majority of us are running these days, which is TLS 1.2. So this is the end-to-end -end encryption of data traffic. Now TLS 1.3s, the elliptical curve encryption is available and starting to be more widely used. Now, if you're already using TLS 1.3, then well done. Um, if not, then you're probably starting to prepare for it. Now, I think most of the software that's uh, the host connectivity software out there that's being used doesn't yet support TLS 1.3, not the versions that are out there being used. Um, there are more and more versions available that will support TLS 1.3, and therefore you you're going to have to move on to those versions to, to actually use TLS 1.3. So part of your planning should really be to start looking at those versions and getting them implemented. What we don't really want is any delay in rolling out new versions because that in itself is a security risk because it's delaying the implementation of TLS 1.3. So we might talk a little bit more about this later on when we talk about software updates. But encryption is only really looking at the data when it's on the wire, when it's being transmitted. Data when it's displayed on the screen is there for all to read and, uh, and abuse. Often this data is sensitive in nature. Uh, many mainframes are running financial applications. These applications hold and display account numbers, credit card numbers, perhaps even the associated CCV numbers. There are times when this data really does need to be displayed, but there's also plenty of times when the data could be hidden or redacted in some way, and we should consider doing that. It isn't just financial data, medical data, personnel details. Practically every application has some sensitive data of some sort. Perhaps we don't need to display the data at all, or perhaps like I'm showing on the screen there, we've got a credit card number where we just redacting the first 12 characters and showing the last four characters as a reference to the card number. The problem we're trying to uh, overcome here is the danger of shoulder surfing. People can walk past or walk up to your desk and look at the screen and see the sensitive data. Even now with social distances, it can still be an issue as people are less likely to be working in an office and more likely to be working at home. Even more reason to hide that sensitive data. So while preventing unauthorized viewing of that sensitive data is important, what I think is just as useful and an, an important safeguard even is the prevention of copying or printing of sensitive data. I know several years ago we started to get requests to be able to hide bits of data when adding it to the clipboard or doing screen prints. Can you imagine the embarrassment of pasting sensitive data into a chat box or somewhere equally horrendous? You know, what would happen if you had a batch of paper that contained screen prints with sensitive data on it getting in the wrong hands? The big hammer approach here is to take away copy and paste or to stop screen prints, but be on the lookout for more subtle approaches that allow you to do things like hide and redact data based on text recognition or perhaps on algorithms or regular expressions. Ah, software patching. So um, I think we probably agree in general that software patching is protection from all kinds of threats. But what I want to talk about in these next couple of slides is really making sure that any software you use for connecting through to your mainframe or any other host systems is actually up to date. Let's consider why. So in our world of mainframe connectivity, typically we have some solutions that use specific software to connect to the mainframe. Uh, in the past, new releases of this software has brought us new features. But to be honest, there was rarely a rush to get into deploying these new releases. Typically, the releases were deployed when the desktop was being refreshed. And this was much the same when SSL and TLS came along and required of us to um, implement encryption. So 
when we rolled out, for example, TLS 1.2, that again happened in more cases than not when the desktop was being refreshed. But now with ever increasing cybersecurity threats, it's important to keep up to date with any patches of or new versions of software that are released. Specifically in the case of mainframe connectivity solutions, it's important to make sure that the latest versions of any encryption libraries are being used. To that end, it's beneficial to be able to deploy updates quickly without any disruption to the business. A worthwhile exercise, which at, at first glance, it may not seem to be directly related to security, but it's to know exactly what connectivity software you're running and where. Um, I'd like to call it sort of like knowing your estate. Um, so I, I think we need to get into a position with our host connectivity software where we know the estate, we know what's out there, we have it documented, and we have it documented how we last um, implemented an upgrade of that software what configurations we have out there, where we have people using it and so on. So the, the mainframe connectivity software is often widely deployed in the business. If, you, if you're planning an update, you need to know where that update needs to be applied and what impact it's likely to have. So I've made a, a list here of some of the things that it's useful to know. It's some of the things that um, we find useful to know. Some of it's easy to find. Um, some of it you can get off the mainframe. Some of it you can get out of um, local systems. Some of it may take a little longer to uh, um, to get and document. So we need to know who's connecting to the mainframe, where they're connecting from, and what sort of software and version of software they're using. What operating system are they running on, and what, what version of that operating system are they using? Most importantly, what hosts are they connecting to? What port are they using? Normally that host and port combination indicates what encryption they're using as well. Sometimes it's even interesting to know what settings they've got in use, um, especially connection and terminal settings. Probably less related to software updates and generally just more good practice to secure data integrity is to know and get a firm understanding of what macros and scripts that people are using and and using in conjunction with different versions of the mainframe connectivity software. Okay, so integrity. So this could cover a multitude of things. Um, data integrity for one, which Malcolm has a few comments on later, but I'm going to talk a little bit about environmental integrity. Specifically, I want to talk about making sure that any deployment of host connectivity software is secure. And when we talk about host connectivity software, we mean software however it's been installed, whether it's a traditional thick client installed and configured at the desktop, or whether it's a centrally managed server-based package. Again, I feel I must mention that these comments are based on things that Malcolm and I and, and, and many of our colleagues have seen and heard when we're talking and visiting customers. Consider the situation where you roll out host connectivity software to a user. If you take the default installation, then you might be giving the user access to products and features which they, with which they could probably pose a security risk. Perhaps the default includes giving file transfer clients to users um, and you don't want them transferring files. Perhaps the default includes emulation to connect to systems other than the mainframes. You may not want users to be able to write macros, but the default is to deploy the macro editor. You may not want the users printing the mainframe screens for fear of it containing sensitive data. You might not want users to be able to change their security settings or edit the mainframe connection details. And likewise, you may not want users to be able to share documents containing configuration files and macros or scripts. So these are just a few of the things that may need your attention before deploying host connectivity software. All of these things are normally easily handled, which will enhance the security and integrity of your host connectivity environment and therefore enhance your data integrity. 
we will look at restricting access to features, locking down access to other features, restricting access to settings, and limiting the distribution of document files, those configuration files and macros. So feature restrictions, we all do it. Um, when we install software, we often take the default options and install what the supplier thinks we need. Um, as I mentioned, if you want to prevent access to a feature of the software, then, then don't install it. Typically in host connectivity software, th this includes like the top level features such as emulation types, connection methods, types of client like emulation and FTP access, um, access to macros and APIs and things like that. So it's that sort of level of um, feature. And there's often a limit to features that can be restricted in this way. It's less likely that you'll be able to stop access to screen printing, for example, at that level. But the majority of product components can normally be restricted. So if you don't want to allow access to FTP client, then don't install it. But there is a balance to be had between security and ease of deployment. If, if some users need access to a feature, but others don't, then with various permutations, you may end up quite quickly with quite a few deployment packages, which isn't really ideal. But there are alternative ways to limit access to features, and, and we'll mention some of those now. So even if you have software features that have been installed, it's, it's possible to lock down access to those features at the user level. This would allow a business to have for example, one or a couple of deployment packages which could be further locked down by, by user. There's often different ways of locking down access by user. Some use security files that define what can and cannot be used. Some are able to link it to the user group policies, um, which is quite useful and quite neat. So one logged on user may have access to file transfer whereas another logged on user would not have access to file transfer, but underlying they would still be using the same package and the same um, installation. A word of warning, sort of uh, be wary of packages that restrict access to features just by removing items from the menus and toolbars. Look for total feature removal. So an example of that, for, for example, if you wanted to remove copy from copy and paste, then you need to do more than just remove it from the menu and toolbar. You need to disable the keystrokes, context menus, um, mouse keys, lots of places, possibly even the APIs. Macros is always an interesting one. When you might want to use us to be able to, well, you might want users to be able to run macros, but you might not want them to be able to create new macros or edit them. So you restrict access to the features using lockdown methods to prevent access to the editor, but to allow access to run the macros. And also, if you use, if you're able to restrict it using group policy, then that method of feature restriction by user can also benefit from elevation of rights. Where if a feature is required occasionally, then an admin can approve the use of that feature until the uh, until the uh, the product is restarted. Another common thing we see is that connectivity software is actually locked down, so they can only use certain features but the access to settings is not. There's a good reason why a user should have access to change some settings on connectivity software. Um, screen colors and fonts are good examples, but there's a number of items where you do not want users to have access. They shouldn't be able to change connection settings like host address and port. Perhaps terminal type should, should be restricted. Um, changing the settings for data privacy, trusted locations, file transfer, printing, and lots more should not be allowed just by default. Like restricting features by user, access to change settings can also be limited by using security files or group policy. Using group policy allow administrators to change settings on the fly using an elevation of rights. Again, that might be useful. So my final slide before I hand back to Malcolm is called document control. Now, I was just talking about restricting access to change settings, especially those connection settings that determine which mainframes and other host systems you can connect to. Now, typically all those settings are held in some sort of configuration file. Sometimes there may be multiple configuration files. So some of the settings like keyboard mapping, keyboard configuration, colors and fonts may be held in separate files. 
Configuration files may also store macros or scripts or macros might be in an external file, another document. Preventing the user from changing settings is undermined in several ways. To start, if a user can gain access to other configuration files, then they might be able to use them. Say that one user emails his configuration files to another user, then the second user now has access to connect to host systems for which he hasn't been authorized. Likewise, macros could be distributed in a similar way. Malcolm will talk a little bit more about macros in a moment, but controls need to be put in place to prevent this happening. So what controls are available? Well, some host connectivity software use the concept of trusted locations. This is the same concept as is available in Office products where a user is restricted to using documents that are in trusted locations, sort of predetermined safe folders where documents can be stored. By having our host connectivity software configuration files in a read-only location, then the user can't copy new files and use them. Likewise, macros. Now, some configuration files, as I mentioned, like the keyboard maps or the color font themes, could be in a trusted lo location where the folder does have, or where the user does have, right access. So use of trusted locations really does control configuration files and all macros and scripts, and, and it prevents the sprawl of these files. Another important thing that you may need to make sure of is that the configuration files are not stored in clear text and that they're not available for modification via notepads or other similar um, utilities. There's no point in locking down access to settings and then allow a user to open a configuration file in notepad and change an IP address. Look for options in your host connectivity software that allow files to be saved in a secure, encrypted way. And with that, I'll hand back to Malcolm for a couple more slides before wrapping up. Thank you, Phil. So let's now look at how integrity can be affected by desktop automation. So the drive for automation has always been there. It's been there for many, many years. Uh, ever since the dumb terminal disappeared and was replaced by a terminal emulation tool that was capable of being able to provide a scripting language for the user to automate tasks on the mainframe. And the macros themselves can be many different types. It could be a simple logon macro, which of course is an issue of course because you don't want users hardwiring their user ID and password into macros so that anybody who came along to their desktop could log on just by using the macro or if they shared that macro that other user could then log on as that other user so obviously we would discourage the use of log on macros as well but of course the key one is automating transactions or automating part of a transaction and of course the organizations still these days run on Excel macros uh, we've, we get come across lots of macros which take information from the spreadsheet and put that into the mainframe system or take information uh, from the mainframe and place it inside a Excel spreadsheet. And here we have an example of some VBA code automating something against the mainframe. And you can see it's written in VBA. Many, many people are used to using VBA. Uh, even home users who are used to using X, using Word or Excel, the Office tools know how to use Visi Visual Basic for applications. So what could possibly go wrong? So let's look at IT developers. Well, they're well trained, of course. They work in a controlled environment. They use methodology. So, for example, they could be using a secure development lifecycle approach. And they develop against a development environment. And that's very important. They go through strict unit testing, system testing, UAT, before they take it into production. Also, they look at things like change control and things like that. Now let's look at what happens today in many, if not most, organizations. The business users create their own macros. They're not trained. They've never been trained in the use of programming languages. Or if they have, they're certainly not operating in a controlled environment. And the, probably the most important thing here is they have no access to a development environment. They develop against a production environment. Now, I'm probably speaking for most, if not all, IT departments if I say that they would not allow their developers in their own IT department to develop against a production environment. In fact, quite generally, 
uh, people in the IT department on the whole are not even allowed near a production environment. And yet here we have business users, untrained and controlled, writing automations against a production environment. So what could possibly go wrong? Well, it can cause wide-scale damage, of course, and cause severe integrity of the information of the organisation if they simply made a mistake. They wrote to the wrong field on the mainframe. In the worst case scenario, of course, this could be undiscovered uh, for many months before the actual problem uh, actually arose. Now, in the way of a summary, now I spoke at some length about the information security triad, the confidentiality, integrity and availability. And I hope we've shown you that uh, from our experience talking to our customers over many years and getting some great feedback from them, that in actual fact the mainframe uh, can actually be secure to the same standards as the rest of the organisation and can therefore comply to the information security triad. So I'd like to thank you very much for your time today. And if you've got any questions, then uh, please put them in the chat window and we'll be happy to answer them. Or please email us at uh, philrichards or malcolm.trig at microfocus.com and we'll be more than happy to, to help you. So I'd just like to ask our chair now if there's any questions for us to answer. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Phil and Malcolm, for taking us through that. I thought it was a really good presentation. There's a lot of um, really good food for thought there, I would say. So do we have any, uh, any questions from anybody? Not at the moment, we don't know. Okay, so do, do you feel free to post? I know we're running um, a bit, uh, uh, we're running over a little bit, so it's uh, our fault, we uh, we started a bit late, um, but please uh, do feel free to put questions in the chat or just raise your hand and uh, we'll happily unmute your line. But Phil and Malcolm, I, I got a couple of thoughts on my side, was um, like one thing you pulled out was around the software patching side. And for me, I think, you know, I think a lot of organizations are very good at doing that in kind of non-mainframe environments, like, you know, very quick to, you know, roll out patches and things to, you know, distributed environments. Um, but when it comes to mainframe, I think it's like a lot of things, the, the forgotten cousin of the estate. And I was doing an assessment um, a couple of years ago when this piece of mainframe security software was so back level, it was ridiculous. Um, and yet the vendor had been pushing out software updates you know, uh, every month, uh, sorry, every few months um, with, and, and when you looked actually in the release notes, there was, you know, references in there to security fixes and things. And uh, so is that, is that your experience? Shall I answer that one, Phil? I'll tell you, yes. <laughs> You're quite right, actually, yes. I mean, uh, for many years, we ourselves saw customers who were perhaps even five versions back from the current release. And that was mainly because they tended to see the software releases as, as feature updates. So yes, it may now have a, a pretty banner or it may have changed the fonts, but it didn't really matter to them. Whereas a big game change was things like PCI DSS and really the, the, the removal of SSL. SSL for years was the de facto security standard for encrypting traffic. And almost overnight that changed. So any organization was slow to respond, were putting themselves at risk of uh, being um, subject to the attack that the SSL um, uh, sort of brought up. So organizers had to suddenly move to SS TLS 1.0 or 1.1, literally almost overnight. Certainly one of my customers literally did that nearly overnight, but they'd kept up to date with their software. So they're in a position to be able to switch over the sessions to use the latest TLS 1. Now, had they been an old version, it would have been having to suddenly be forced to make a, a software change. And as you know yourself, if you're five versions behind, you have to go through more testing than if you're just a hotfix behind or an update behind. So yes, I would agree with your comments. Um, keeping current these days is, is important because there are feature enhancements, but on the whole these days, it's mainly security patches to software mm -hmm. these days. Yeah, and 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 also on you know that I think that's the driver for this, and, and I keep harping on about you know sort of the regulations and things. If you read in the small print there, and say small print, it's actually quite sort of well written, you know, well, well publicized. Publicized, I would say, is that like it states things like keep your security software like up to date, you know, with, with the, in line with vendor recommendations. Uh, but yet, you know, some institutions just do not, you know, uh, keep up with that. So it's like, well, you're not actually complying with, you know, what, you know, the regulators or the, you know, the security standards out there are actually saying. So, 
Yeah, that's correct. Yes. And we tend to find these days that uh, security departments are, are becoming less likely to allow mainframe uh, departments to just say it's difficult to implement a control here. So therefore, we'll accept the risk because it's now going up to executive level where the, the chief information security officer will probably come down and say, no, no. The, the, the thoughts of being in the press on the front page of that newspaper <laughs> as a GDPR compliance issue it is not one that I particularly want to put my job on the line with. So therefore you will comply and there are controls out there. So go and, go and, go and implement them. In, indeed, indeed. Okay, so it doesn't look like we have any more questions and we are right out of time. So I just want to say, Malcolm, Phil, thank you very much for uh, for your session. I, like I say, I really enjoyed it. And there's a lot of food for thought there, I think, of things that we you know we, we all need to be considering as so, you know how to get the very best, you know, uh, security and, you know, out of our environment. And I still love the CIA principles. As, you know, they, as, I, as I say many times, they, there's something that we very much security professionals must uphold at all times. Um, so, yeah, this is session 1BA, folks, for the purpose of feedback. Um, please do do that. Um, don't forget that the first question, the best answer you can give is five. And then the other questions uh, are the best answer is nine. Um, go to the agenda, click on Malcolm and Phil's uh, session, and you can scroll right down to the bottom and, and see the feedback link there. Um, or you can do it um, through the app. Um, sorry for the QR code. Um, so that's that's that. Thank you very much. Um, and oh, oh, by the way, and don't forget to give to the charity. I've just been looking at the current donation um, status. So you know, donations are going up. But if you can, please, if you haven't done so so far, you can please do that and click on the Virgin Money link that you see under each session. That will take you directly um, uh, to the, uh, the the donation website. We've got a break now. So we've got about 20 minute break, it's 10.30. And the next security session is at midday. So please do join us for that. But there are sessions that start at 10.30. There's some technical sessions running, but if you uh, don't fancy something technical, then there is the mainframe skills and learning track, which is quite an interesting session, which I might join, which is, titled Will I Like Mainframe, Wilma, um, a project to support recruitment on the mainframe. And that's with uh, Dr. Herb Daly. So that should be quite an interesting session. So I think there's something for everybody at 10.30. So do join us if you can. And uh, like I said, thank you very much, Malcolm and Phil, for your session. Um, I'm sure we'll have you back at some point at GSE. So uh, thank you for taking the time to prepare it. No, thank you very much, Jamie and Sue. And thank you to everybody attending as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye.